thank you very much. I don't know where you got those instruments because those are the ones I've used to extract bipartisan votes out of the legislature. <laughs> Uh, it's an honor to be uh, on the same program as Dr. Tyson, so I will be brief. Uh, I think there's no question but that uh, the efficiency of Oregon's healthcare system uh, is greater than that in many parts of the country. But the fact remains that our healthcare system still remains financially unsustainable over time. So what I want to do, uh, and it's a drag on business in many ways, and it also erodes the wages. So I want to take just a few minutes and talk about Oregon's vision for healthcare transformation in this state and why I think it can bring a huge competitive advantage to Oregon businesses. And I'll do this in seven minutes. <laughs> the fundamental problem with our healthcare system, as you know, is the growing discrepancy between the cost of care and our ability to pay for it. And there are two traditional strategies that both public sector and private sector payers have used to address medical inflation. One is to simply cut provider reimbursement rates, and the other is to cut the number of people who have coverage. Now, these two strategies simply create barriers to access so people avoid seeking needed care until they get real sick and end up in the emergency room where the costs are a lot higher. And while both these strategies allow both public and private payers to reduce their short-term exposure to medical inflation, they actually serve as a pressure valve that allows us to avoid confronting the real underlying problem, which is the cost of health care itself. So as a result, neither of these strategies is effective because the uncompensated care incurred by the uninsured is simply shifted back to you through increases in your premiums. So if you think about it, the business model that underlies the American healthcare system is based on the assumption that the government and private sector employers will continue to finance the growing cost of healthcare. And for payers to continue to use these cost avoidance and cost shifting strategies does not hold the healthcare system itself accountable and it puts no pressure on the system to redesign their own business model, and in the end, you continue to pay for the increased cost of care uh, through the cost shift. Now, this uh, impacts both public and private payers. For the state, where revenues are growing at about 4% a year, a Medicaid inflation rate at 5.4% a year erodes our ability to invest in education and workforce training and a whole host of other priorities. For private sector payers, medical inflation erodes your ability to invest in plant and equipment, it increases absenteeism, it reduces productivity, and it creates conflict with labor. So what we've done in Oregon essentially over the past three years is to design a new business model or a new care model for healthcare, starting with the 600,000 people who are on the Oregon Health Plan. We were able to take advantage of the fact that a significant portion of the $3.5 billion deficit that we faced in 2011 was in the Medicaid budget, both because more people were on the program because of the recession and also because we lost about a billion dollars of federal stimulus money. So we had no new money to invest, and we're faced with really one of two choices. We could continue to use the old cost-shifting, uh, cost-cutting uh, um, strategies of the past, or we could try to create a new business model that would give us more value in terms of health for each dollar we spent on health care. And we decided to redesign the new business model, which, if you think about it, is what Intel and Nike and many small and medium-sized businesses do all the time. When the business environment changes, they redesign their business model to fit the new circumstances, not the old circumstances. And I submit that's exactly what the healthcare system has to do as well. So in order to do that, we needed three things. First, we needed courageous leaders to step up in the healthcare community. We needed flexibility of the federal government, particularly in how we paid for care. And we need an investment of money to give us uh, some resources to help us actually make this difficult transition. Now, I'm proud to say that a lot of very courageous leaders did step up in Oregon's healthcare community. We should be very proud of them uh, and for their courage. To support them, I went to D.C. and negotiated the flexibility from the federal government that we needed and secured also $1.9 billion in, in federal resources to actually invest on the front end to help make this transition work. In return, Oregon agreed to reduce the per capita Medicaid inflation rate by two percentage points, from 5.4 down to 3.4, and to be held accountable for some rigorous metrics on outcomes and access and quality. The cost reduction element is very, very significant. By reducing medical inflation below the rate of the growth of state revenues, we're opening up a delta in the general fund for reinvestment, $200 million in savings this biennium, $400 million next biennium, $600 million in the 1921 biennium. As of today, 95% of our Medicaid population is in 16 new coordinated care organizations, or CCOs, which reflect this new business model. And now 18 months in, not only are they meeting their cost reduction metrics, 
but they're also producing some pretty remarkable health outcomes. Emergency, emergency department utilization is down 8%, primary care visits are up 18%, adoption of uh, patient-centered primary care homes has increased 36%, uh, we've reduced admission rates for congestive heart failure by 29%. So the next step is to take this care model beyond Medicaid and move it into the private market. And here's how we're going to do it. Oregon purchases health care now for over 900,000 people on Medicaid, which reflects those who came in under the expansion of the Affordable Care Act. 900,000, <coughs> excuse me. We also purchased care for 300,000 state employees and school teachers and their dependents. So in total, Oregon now purchases care for 1.2 million people, one out of every three covered lives in Oregon, which makes us a very big player uh, in the market. So we intend to use that purchasing power to ask qualified health plans to align with this new care model starting with public employees. So as you know, state employees get their health care through the Public Employees Benefit Board, which offers a number of choices from which public employees can choose. School teachers get their care through the Oregon Education Benefit Board, which is a similar kind of exchange. In our current budget, we have capped the growth of PEB at 3.4%, which is the same percentage under which the CCOs are operating. And last month, we've selected a number of health plans, including several coordinated care organizations that can offer their product as a high-quality, low-cost option on the Public Employees Benefit Board. And we plan to follow suit with the Oregon Education Benefit Board. Here's the point. If those 300,000 people and their dependents were in a care model that grew at 3.4% a year, the 10-year savings to the general fund would be in the neighborhood of $5 billion. That is a total game-changer for state finances. Making that same care model available to private sector employers would likewise be a game changer in terms of having a huge competitive advantage for doing business here in the state of Oregon. So to do that, the next step is to actively begin to align public sector and private sector purchasing strategies to accelerate the transformation or transition to a system that rewards quality and outcomes rather than simply volume. And I think we need to take advantage of this opportunity over the next couple of years. And for us to be successful, this organization and businesses around the state have got to play a leading role. I want to close by saying that we all know this is an election year. But I tell you, I've never thought I'd see the day when providing access to health care, particularly primary and, and preventive care, would become a partisan political issue in the state of Oregon. The, the Oregon Health Plan passed with huge bipartisan majorities in 1987. And so did the foundational legislation that created our current health care transformation before the ACA was even implemented. In fact, Senate Bill 1580 that created the business model for our coordinated care organizations passed the House of Representatives in 2012 by a vote of 53 to 7 in a House that was evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats. I think that's the Oregon way. I think that's what Oregonians expect. I think they know that the future is not going to be created by people who are clinging to the past and they want solutions rather than slogans. I want to end just with a quote from Robert Kennedy, who said, it is easier to fall in step with the slogans of others than to march to the beat of the internal drummer, to make and stand on judgments of your own. And it is far easier to accept and stand on the past than to fight for the answers of the future. With your help, starting from the depths of the recession three years ago, this state has been fighting and finding the answers of the future for the past three years, and we're not going to stop now. Thank you very much.